Hey guys, MCN Mike here. Pokemon has been a big part of my life ever since I was about six years old. Once I booted up Pokemon Sapphire for the first time on my Nintendo DS Lite, there was no going back. 13 years later, I'm witnessing the next evolution <laughs> of the Pokemon franchise in the form of Sword and Shield. Going into this game, I was optimistic. Contrary to the fan-induced complaints that took place months prior to the game's release, I was ready to experience the new generation of Pokemon. Nobody could stop me from doing so. If you told someone 10 years ago that Pokemon would be in full 3D with over 1,000 Pokemon to ever exist, they'd probably scream because you randomly appeared in their house thanks to time travel being awkward. Um, but seriously. The scope of this game was, and it still is, a sight to behold. Unlike the other 20 plus reviewers you've probably watched before this video, I didn't get the game early. So that's why this review is coming a month after release, as I need some time to play the game, get footage for the video, and I also want to be able to form my own opinions and not miss a thing. Not to mention, a lot has been happening in my personal life with college classes and a bit of uh, personal health issues no need to worry i'm okay so that's the reason why this review has been delayed time and time again trust me if i could pump out videos like a drive or some other big pokétuber i totally would to be fair he is a content creator full time and i'm just a college student that's not the point uh, just let's talk about sword and shield roll the intro the story, for the most part, is predictable at best, and it follows almost all the predecessors, with the exception of Sun and Moon, since those games had no gyms and they had the island challenges. Essentially, you have to defeat the eight gyms in order to make your way to the city of Winden and defeat champion Leon and become the champion yourself. You start your journey in the very British-sounding city of Postwick, where you're given your starter Pokémon from the current champion, aka your rival Hop's older brother, Leon. On my playthrough, I chose Grookey because hashtag Grookey Gang has been the way to go since the starters were first revealed. All starters are comparatively irrelevant to Grookey. After that, the game's story basically follows the established Pokemon formula. Along the way, you'll encounter two of your biggest rivals from time to time. Hop, which is Leon's number one fan that always tries to be just like him, and Marnie, the adorable emo character who we don't deserve, who specializes in Dark-type Pokémon. While I'd love to get more into the story, I think it'd be better if you experienced it for yourself. Plus, the video would be over a half hour long, and I'm sure you have better ways to spend your time than watching me talk about Pokémon. Pokémon Sword and Shield brought us 81 new Pokémon which is the second lowest amount of new Pokemon revealed for a main series game, with X and Y only giving us 72 back in 2013. While others would disagree, I think the designs for this generation were interesting and fairly solid for the most part. You didn't have any Generation 5 scenarios where there were Pokemon just based off of inanimate objects, at least not often. There were one or two that I think were a little unoriginal as some people would label them, but otherwise, I like the designs. A few personal favorites of mine were Ice Q, which is a penguin with a block of ice for a head, and Corviknight, which is some kind of cool dark bird thing. Something about it really jumped out at me when I played the Pokemon Sword and Shield demo at the World Championships earlier this year, as my preset team in the demo featured that Batman-esque bird. As for my team, I think I had a decent balance in terms of type effectiveness. I do wish I used more Pokemon from the current generation though, as only a third of my team, as you can see in the image, is from the current generation, and that's counting my starter. Pokemon Sword and Shield brought quite a bit back in terms of the gameplay. Of course, the fundamentals are still present, with the turn-based combat and stats if you're into making uh, Pokemon perfect for competitive use. However, I want to talk about the new features that were added this time around. Introduced in a special Pokemon Direct on June 5th, 2019, almost a week before E3, we have Dynamax, a feature only specific to gyms and raid battles. It allows one of your Pokemon to grow massive 
and unleash devastating moves on your opponents. Use this wisely though, as after 3 turns your Pokemon will return to normal size. While it was cool to control a huge Pokemon, I think this feature should have been used in other places besides gyms and raid battles. Sure, you use it multiple times during the post game, but even then, it's still used in the exact same locations. Adding on to the Dynamax functionality is Gigantamax. Some people that are out of the loop may think that these two features are one and the same, and you're not entirely wrong by saying so. However, allow me to explain the difference for those unfamiliar or for those that haven't picked up the game a month after release. Unlike Dynamax, Gigantamax alters the form of a few select Pokemon. For example, a normal Snorlax would look like the image on my left, and Gigantamax Snorlax looks like the image on my right. You can see that Snorlax's form has been drastically changed. On top of having access to many Dynamax moves, every Gigantamax Pokemon has a special move dedicated to only them. Using Snorlax as an example again, its Gigantamax move is G-Max Replenish, which restores any consumed berries. One might wonder, where do you encounter these new massive Pokemon outside of the gyms? Well, introducing Max Raid Battles. In the new wild area, you'll see red pillars of light coming out of dens, which represent a raid taking place in the depths below. Up to four players can participate in a raid online, and the objective is to defeat the giant Pokemon in either a certain amount of time or before four Pokemon faint. Once either one of those happens, you'll be kicked out of the den and will have to restart the raid. Earlier, I said this could be done with up to four people via Nintendo Online. That's highly recommended because, to be honest, the AI trainers that take up the empty slots suck. I'm looking at you, Wobbuffet trainer that always uses counter when it doesn't even get hit. Sorry, pinched a nerve. While on the subject of alternate forms, Sword and Shield introduced Galarian forms of 14 Pokemon, plus 6 evolutions for those, you know, aforementioned Galarian forms. Personally, I wasn't big on Sun and Moon's Alolan forms, but I think the designs for Galarian forms are way better. My personal favorite has to be Galarian Yum Mask. I mean, look at it. It gives off a rustic vibe, and it still retains a ghost type to give off a mysterious look. Not to mention its evolution expands on the rustic pieces and frankly just looks awesome. With all these positives, how can you go wrong? Well, here's a small gripe I have with raid battles. In past generations, we've had up to 100 TMs or technical machines. However, this time around, we still have 100 TM moves, but now we have 100 TRs or technical records. What are they exactly? Well, they're the exact same thing, however they break after one use, similar to how TMs used to act before Generation 5. In my playthrough, I wanted to teach my Bolton Thunderbolt, but it was a TR that was exclusive to raid battles. Now, you can't go to just any raid that is happening and expect to get your TR, you know, instantaneously. You have to find the right Pokemon at the right den and hope to god there was a raid happening in that specific spot. It took me forever to figure this out, and I ended up getting quite frustrated at this. If it wasn't for Cerebi.net, I still would have been confused today. The Galar region, as we all know at this point, is based off of the UK. So some may wonder how that translated into the game's region design. Well, I was certainly compelled by the town designs. You had towns like the ones on screen that provide a small town atmosphere, and on the other side you had places like Winden that managed to put a modern spin on the old town look and have it blend perfectly. It's not a boring old city with brick buildings like other locations, but it's not a totally futuristic place like most Pokemon League cities tend to look like. It's that healthy balance of environments that makes this game really shine in area design. However, I will say, it is a bit strange to see the aforementioned Old Town scenery and suddenly a giant modern looking stadium just smack dab in the middle. It kind of breaks the illusion, but I see that they were trying to make the gyms the focal point of their respective towns because, well, they are. Previously mentioned, another big addition to the series are the wild areas. These expansive masses of land are honestly incredible. 
There are multiple smaller regions in the wild area with different Pokemon in each of them. Weather also plays a massive part in the wild area as each region also changes what Pokemon it has depending on the condition. For example, a blizzard will cause more ice type Pokemon to appear and a sandstorm causes more ground types to appear. In each mini area are a few dens. These dens hold different Pokemon depending on where in the wild area you are and come in common or rare spawns. You can tell it's a rare Pokemon because of the pillar of light coming from the den. If it's purple, that's when you know it's rare as opposed to just the standard red light you see in all the gameplay. I think the wild area is an incredible addition to the series as its environment allows many Pokemon to spawn everywhere. Additionally, you no longer have to go to a specific route to visit the daycare, and they actually move to a small remote spot in the wild area. The variety of Pokemon that can be found here is honestly astounding, and grinding raids has been a particularly fun pastime for me. I'd like to see this return in future games, as it's a nice way to access many Pokemon and there could be a lot done with this to expand on everything that's present as opposed to just the daycare and the wild Pokemon. You could put so much more in there. With every new installation of a series comes small additions that make the game just a little bit better to play. Pokemon is no exception to this as since the DS days Pokemon games have taken up online interaction via Wi-Fi. Uh, F in the chat for Nintendo Wi-Fi connection, by the way. These days, you could trade and battle with friends as well as players from all around the world. So, going into Sword and Shield, we have some interesting design choices. For one, we no longer have the Festival Plaza from Sun and Moon, which many are very happy with, myself included. Replacing the Internet functionality hub is the Ycom, which contains all the features that Pokemon is known for having in their games. I like the look of the Ycom, personally. It's simplistic, and everything is organized the way it should be, and it's in a small remote spot, and you can only access it when you press the Y button, hence the name. However, there is a big flaw with the Internet functionality that I've noticed over time. You'll notice the stamps on the right side of the screen that show whether someone just caught a Pokemon or is looking for people to join a raid. Well, this feature isn't exactly as open as you'd expect. I've encountered countless issues with the badges just not updating, even if raids are happening. It's even worse when you're the one trying to get raid members, but nobody can join you because they can't see it on their YCOM either. It's really frustrating, and I hope Game Freak improves on this in the near future. Maybe a patch or server maintenance. Beyond multiplayer, there are just a few small details that make things just so much better, I guess. Pokemon Camp was a new feature implemented to help you grow the happiness stat of your Pokemon. You could do this by playing with Pokemon by throwing a ball around or making curry and filling up the curry decks. As you can see, I didn't use this feature that much, but if you're bored and looking for something to do, consider growing some berries and start cooking. Another small improvement is something I like to call multi-item use. Back in the DS days, if you were one of the people that used an action replay device, yes, myself included, odds are you gave yourself 999 rare candies to make battle easier. However, the process of continuously pressing the A button to feed your Pokemon rare candies to make it level 100 was tedious, and chances are you got arthritis afterwards. This time around, that problem has since been removed. Let's say you've been grinding raids for EXP candies and you want to level up your Pokemon really fast. Well, now you can select how many EXP candies you want to use on one Pokemon. No longer will you wear out your A button on your controller trying to make yourself OP. Here on the MCN Mike channel, we don't give numbers for reviews. I find that a number out of 10 is arbitrary and doesn't really summarize a game's experience. So instead, let me summarize what I think of the game with words. Pokemon Sword and Shield are great additions to not just the Pokemon series, but the Nintendo Switch game lineup. Despite the countless complaints surrounding multiple aspects of the game, I think those arguments are mostly unjustified now that I've had a month to really experience the game for myself. While the graphical quality may suffer in a few spots, the game looks great for what it is. It's an RPG. It's Pokemon. It was never really too focused on the graphics to begin with. 
yeah, we may have Nintendo 64 style trees in the wild area, but those are a fraction of how expansive the area is in general. It's supposed to be a massive open place for you to catch Pokemon and join raids, you know, the main focus of the games. And beyond graphics, the story is compelling. Yes, it does get in the way of exploration, as it just wants you to go from one gym to the next and nothing more. However, I found myself legitimately interested in the plot of the game. I understand. Not every Pokemon being in the game is a bummer. It is. But I found this to be a great opportunity to try Pokemon that I otherwise wouldn't have used. I used a Garboder. Alright, not many people could say they actually did that besides, like, Chugga Conroy. Back in black and white. I got to try new Pokemon, and I'm not disappointed. All that being said, every good game has its flaws. I did find the frame rate tanking a little bit in places like the Wild Area and Dynamax Battles, which, yes, it was a bit frustrating for me. The online definitely needs to be revised, as it's hard to find raids to join since the YCOM doesn't really update in real time. Now, we're no strangers to Nintendo Online not exactly being of the best quality, so this was kind of expected, but it also kind of wasn't, if that makes any sense. I did say in my No National Dex miniseries that if Sword and Shield end up being bigger than 8GB, I would start to be skeptical about the overall quality of the game that we ended up getting. Well, Sword and Shield are 9.5GB uh, upon release, so that is making me raise an eyebrow on the whole legitimacy of Game Freak's claims. After this whole review, if you're still not 100% sure whether you should pick up Pokemon Sword or Shield, I have one thing to say to you. Platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, among others, can easily sway one's opinion. And I can understand why you don't want to drop $60 on a game you're not sure you'll enjoy. However, I took a shot in the dark with these games because I had good faith in the series based on previous experience. I've played every Pokemon game there was. If Pokemon is a series you legitimately enjoy and have for years, go with your gut. Don't let any social media hate against the developers or the game in general change your perspective in any way. Gameplay experiences are subjective, and they're unique to every player. If at the end of the day, you truly don't like these games, at least you could say you gave the games a fair shot by trying them firsthand. Thanks for watching my Sword and Shield review. Sorry this took so long to make. Things have been crazy in my life, and have gotten in the way of work on YouTube. I always follow my personal philosophy of academics over hobbies, and this is merely an example of that taking effect. Speaking of schedules, I hope you all have a great winter break. Uh, I hope to get streams going while I'm on break. I'm still moving in from campus, so I can't be too sure that I'll be able to stream over my winter break, but I'll try to upload uh, at least one more video before my winter break is over. Maybe something about what I hope gaming looks like in 2020. Who knows? Be sure to subscribe to this channel down below with notifications on so you know my next upload. Uh, and be sure to follow my Twitch channel in the description below so you can talk to me live. Maybe talk about your experiences with Pokemon Sword and Shield in my Twitch chat. I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I'll see you guys in the next one. <laughs> see you later.